In this video, we're going to talk about how to get a uh, Ubuntu virtual machine running on a Windows host and get it all configured and set up so that you're ready to jump into development immediately. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go find uh, VirtualBox and install it. So, you know, how did I get here? It's pretty easy. Just uh, Google VirtualBox download and Oracle VM VirtualBox is the first first link, click Windows Hosts, boom, download, click Save, install it. Once it's installed, you can run it, and it looks something like this. I mean, you won't have all these machines here on the left, but otherwise the client looks quite a bit like this. And then we're going to need uh, a copy of Ubuntu to install on the virtual, virtual machine that we'll create. So how do we get a copy of Ubuntu? We're going to go for Ubuntu uh, you can just search Ubuntu download and the desktop one is the one we want uh, because this is just going to be your you know simple uh, desktop replacement VM so we could run anything that we would want Ubuntu for for development purposes and we're going to grab Ubuntu 18.04.3 LTS I think I actually grabbed 0.2 LTS before this uh, before I started recording this video um, but uh, it should be exactly the same. The important point is that it has to be 18.04 or else all the things that I'm going to show you here, you know, well, some of them might work and some of them might not. So you click download on this guy and the download should start. It does. You save it, you'll end up with this ISO file. Okay, so when that finishes, what do you do with your ISO file? You're going to put it into the virtual disk drive of a virtual machine. So first we're going to create a virtual machine. Uh, so that was downloading VirtualBox and Ubuntu Desktop 18.04 LTS, installing VirtualBox. Now we need to create a new virtual machine and give it enough disk space. So we'll create one. We'll call this Ubuntu VM. And it sort of already detects that this is Linux and it's going to be Ubuntu 64-bit. So we'll go next. Give it a certain amount of RAM. You want to give it enough RAM. Let's give it 4 gigs, 4096 megs. It kind of depends how much you have available in your system. Uh, you really want to give it something like four gigs to uh, to ensure that you know you don't have lots of like swapping of memory to disk. So why am I okay giving that much memory because I have 32 gigs of RAM and you know like 12 or 13 gigs free. So giving that about four gigs. Now we're going to create a virtual hard disk, and they recommend 10 gigs, but uh, I would actually recommend 20 gigs. I think you run out of space with 10 gigs pretty quickly. So we'll change that to 20 and we'll go create. Okay, now we actually have this machine. Now it doesn't have Ubuntu installed on it, it's just a virtual machine. Uh, we also have to do some configuration. So we'll click settings uh, and uh, we're going to uh, go to system. You've got enough RAM there. I'm going to go processor and I'm, I'm going to give it a few processors. So it has a sort of a point where the graph changes from this nice color to this, hey, you probably shouldn't be here color. So I'll go just right up to the end of the nice color. Uh, and under display, it's it's probably a good idea to max out the video RAM. It's, this is probably an insignificant amount of main memory on your system, so I wouldn't worry about the cost of maxing it out. Under storage, we have controller IDE. We have this uh, CD or DVD looking thing, which is where we will mount our disk image. So to mount the disk image, we click that, we go choose virtual optical disk, and we're going to throw in the ISO. You might have to browse to find the ISO wherever you downloaded it. So I'll, I'll just put this one in, this 18.04.2 uh, that I downloaded earlier. And then under network, we're going to go advanced and port forwarding, and we're going to need to forward a port because we're going to want to be able from our host machine, the Windows machine, to SSH into this machine. And this machine, this virtual machine, is not going to have by default uh, any IP address that our host machine can actually access. It'll be on a completely different subnet than our host machine. So we need to basically add a port forwarding rule that will take an address that our host machine can access and turn it into uh, this weird private different subnet address of the VM so that our when we send traffic to this accessible host address it'll reach the guest virtual machine. So we're going to add this, it doesn't matter what the name is, protocol TCP is fine. The host IP we're going to use 127.0.1.1. This is a, a loopback address, this is basically localhost uh, and 
Now the host port of 22 is the SSH port. But the thing is, you might want to, you might not want to use 22 um, because that's going to basically tie up port 22 on your host machine, and you might want to use port 22 for something else. Um, I typically go for like 222 or 2222. It's sort of thematically consistent with the port 22 for SSH. Uh, so when you connect to the guest, you're really going to be connecting to port 222 on address 127.0.1.1. Now that's not an address on the guest. That's an address on your host machine. But your host machine is gonna observe this rule and say, hey, wait, that traffic is not meant for me. That traffic is meant for this VM. And it's gonna forward it to the VM's guest IP, which is actually going to be 10.0.2.15 probably. Uh, I think that's what's typical for a default VM in this version of VirtualBox and a default Ubuntu. Uh, installation and we'll see how we can confirm that this is the correct guest IP address once we fire up Ubuntu and then we have to set a guest port and the guest port is going to be the SSH port okay so that's all the configuration that we need uh, we'll click OK and then we'll actually fire up this virtual machine so it's starting up it starts up in this tiny window here and we'll give it a moment to uh, boot into the Ubuntu setup now in this video I'm going to be kind of cutting uh, a lot of you know wasted time out because obviously installing Ubuntu and running all the scripts I got to run, running all the installation processes actually takes lots of time, and I don't want this to be like an hour long video as I do this setup. So let's uh, cut some wasted time out. Okay, so we booted into the Ubuntu setup. Uh, we're going to click install Ubuntu and it's going to ask us for keyboard layout. The US one is the least annoying even if you're a Canadian like me. And we'll pretty much just go for a normal installation, download updates while installing, that's fine. Installing third-party software for graphics and Wi-Fi. You probably don't need this because this is just a virtual machine and it's you're probably not going to be watching YouTube videos or anything on it so you can you know leave this unchecked. We'll go continue. And then erase disk and install Ubuntu. Don't worry, the disk you're going to erase is not your main hard disk on your host machine. It's just the virtual hard disk. So it's going to give you maybe a scary looking warning. It's going to blow away your disk. That's fine. And then it's going to ask you what time zone you're from. You can type the city where you're from and it'll try to figure out where you are. I mean, uh, I might as well stick with Toronto because that's where we are. But let's, uh, let's look at Kitchener or Waterloo just to show how this works. So Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. See if that comes up. Waterloo, let's try Waterloo, Ontario. Nah, it doesn't seem to wanna, doesn't seem to wanna show up. Maybe I can find it here in the list. Oh, there it is. Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And clicking it didn't change anything. So, well, that's done. Then we have to specify what we want our name to be. Uh, tutorial guy. And by default, this will become part of the computer name. Uh, and we want a username. So uh, I'm going to just stick with tutorial well. Let's make it just tutorial so it's not quite so obnoxious to type. And then we have to pick some passwords. So I'm going to pick the uh, very secure ASDF. And you might want to just have login automatically so you don't have to type in the password. It's just a VM only accessible from your computer. So you don't need the strictest of security protocols here. Okay, and now it's just gonna copy, so I'll cut out some time, wasted time here. Or maybe I'll not by accident because I sent the appropriate hotkey to the virtual machine. Okay, now I'll cut out some time. Okay, so now that the installation has got to the point where we have to restart, I'm gonna click restart now. And then it asks us to remove the installation medium and then reboots. So the installation medium is just that ISO that we inserted. Uh, it turns out that the default behavior of VirtualBox is after it sort of detects that this installation has happened. When I close this window and go power off the machine, uh, it has actually automatically already removed the boot media. So I can just double click and run the machine again. So I'll cut out a little wasted time here as this boots up. Now this thing is booted up, we have a what's new in Ubuntu that we can just kind of dismiss. Just get rid of all this stuff. No, don't send system info. Not for a virtual machine. 
Okay, so now we're at the desktop. And our next step is to try to install SSH. I'd also confirm that our choice of network uh, address was correct. So I'll press Control Alt T to open up a terminal. And uh, I believe IF config, which will tell me the IP address is not installed by default, so we can install it. sudo apt install net tools. We need the password, the ASDF. And then once we install net tools, we can use the IF config utility to print out all of the IP addresses for all the attached network cards. So I have config, and we see there's the loopback 127.0.0.1, and there's this 10.0.2.15, so my guess was correct. And this is the address where, if I was not correct, uh, you would go into the uh, network advanced port forwarding and you would change this to uh, whatever address you see for this ENP0S3 adapter. But it looks like we were fine. So our port forwarding is all set up. Now we just need an SSH server to be running. We can check whether there's an SSH server running. I can try to SSH to localhost. Nope, my connection is refused. So this means that there's no SSH server running. So I want to sudo apt install SSH. So this will install SSH server. I forget whether it actually uh, starts the SSH server, but I think it probably does. It created a symlinks for the service. So let's try to SSH to localhost again. Press up twice to get this old command. Yes, I can SSH to, to localhost. It's going to basically say uh, we're encountering a new machine that we've never encountered before. Here's a fingerprint for this machine. Do you want to add this machine to our list of known machines? I type yes. Boom, it's added. Now it asks for the password. We've got our ASDF password, and I've SSH'd into my own machine from my own machine, my, my virtual machine. So from the virtual machine, I've SSH'd into the virtual machine. Not terribly interesting. So I'll just exit that SSH connection. And now I want to SSH from the Windows host machine to this virtual machine. So how do I do that? I'm going to open PuTTY, which is my preferred terminal for Windows. I'm going to type in 127.0.1.1. Now this is an address on the host machine but I'm trying to get into the VM and the port 222. So this is what we configured in the, the network settings, the advanced tab, the port forwarding. So when we connect to this host name and port, we're actually going to be uh, having PuTTY, uh, oh, sorry, having, having VirtualBox uh, route uh, all of the traffic to the private address 10.0.2.15 port 22, uh, which is basically the same as this local host that we SSH'd into on the VM. So this is going to be SSHing into the VM. Uh, we can specify hostname, port, we can specify a username. This is under connection and data, so I can specify the username is supposed to be tutorial. And uh, rather than prompting, it can just automatically provide the username. And I'll save this as, you know, tutorial. I can save that session. And I'll open that session. Now it's going to give me the same question. It is a potential security breach whenever you add a new machine you've never encountered before, because if some other machine masqueraded as the machine you think you're connecting to, you would accept that fake machine's key fingerprint, and someone else could intercept all of your data and act as a proxy or something. In this case, we know exactly what we're configuring uh, a connection to, what we're connecting to. It's our own VM. So yes is the correct choice here. And it's going to ask us for the password, which is our ASDF. And there we go, we've actually connected. So we've connected to the virtual machine from the outer Windows machine. I can run ls, I can run top to see what's going on in the system. Uh, we've actually made this connection so I can sort of do the same thing that I could do in this virtual machine window uh, from an SSH interface on the host. Okay, so that's not particularly interesting, although it's nice not to have to do things in the tiny VM window. You can make this VM window bigger, by the way. Um, but uh, what we want to do beyond just connecting through SSH is we want to be able to use SCP to transfer files from the host to the uh, VM. And so here I have this program called WinSCP, which is my preferred uh, way of transferring files to and from 
a VM. It's sort of like an FTP client. If you've ever used an FTP client to upload files to some remote server for you know web development or something, SCP is very similar, except it's going to do the file transfer through SFTP. It's file transfer protocol mediated through SSH. So all you need is SSH access, and you can upload files. So I'll add a new site. The new site is going to be 127.0.1.1. 222 is the port. The username is tutorial. The password is ASDF. I'm going to save the file protocol as F SFTP. That's fine. I'll save the password. It's not recommended, but who cares? And I'll click OK. And here it is. And I can log in. And again, you know, potential security breach. In this case, it's it, I'm updating. Uh, the reason for this are kind of complicated, why it's not adding and it's updating instead. Anyway, don't worry about it. On your end, it should say add. And if it says update, you shouldn't hesitate to do so in this particular case. And here we actually have the remote file system on the VM, right? If I, if I do, you know, ls, I'll see this is exactly the remote file system that I'm accessing. And on the left, I have my local file system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go uh, get uh, some scripts that uh, I've designed to make it easy to uh, set up everything you would want for a complete development environment in Ubuntu, including uh, really nice uh, sort of like bash customization, uh, you know, installing power line for really pretty looking prompts and just having really nice defaults and having a nice text editor installed and all sorts of fantastic utils getting installed. So I'm going to copy these, uh, these, uh, scripts over. So part one and part two. And we're going to run the stuff in part one. Uh, this is sort of an interesting time to, to make a point. We have kind of like a very clean VM image right now. And we're about to, you know, run these complicated scripts that do a whole bunch of stuff and maybe could mess up the state of our VM. So we might want to actually kind of capture the state of our VM. Uh, so we could roll back to it if something went wrong. And we can do that using the snapshot feature of VirtualBox. So I can, I can, uh, I forget, I have the snapshot window open, but I forget how I actually got it open. Oh, I clicked the snapshots button up here. So I can close the snapshots menu. Here's the, the view that you would normally see. Uh, and if I, uh, let's see, how do I open up the snapshots? Ah, machine tools, snapshots. So here I have the snapshots window open and we have the current state and I can take a snapshot of the current state. I can actually do, uh, you know, uh, what clean image I can, I can do, I can take a live snapshot, an online snapshot of this machine as it's running. And so if something goes wrong, I can just kind of hard power off the machine and then I can right click and I can restore the state of the snapshot. Uh, when I actually try to power this thing off, if I click X, uh, I can I can click restore current snapshot and it'll restore the state of this and I can power it back on to this exact state. In this case, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to click cancel. Uh, but I do want to run these scripts. So let's go to part one. We have to chmod this thing 755 so I can run it. And then we're going to run this script. So the first thing it does is it sets up passwordless sudo for this user. So whatever your user is, you're going to end up having sudo access without having to enter a password. And then this is the one uh, 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 attended stage of this install script. Unfortunately, there's no way as far as I can tell to get rid of this question. And so you have to press yes on this. And then the rest of this install, which is fairly long, uh, you know, many minutes, uh, which is just to install tons of packages, all sorts of really useful stuff. Uh, it's all going to do it unattended, so you, you can just leave it alone and let it finish. And that's actually why I split this into part one and part two, because the part one is all the unattended stuff, and then in part two you have uh, you know a few small installs that are attended and require some extra config. So I'm going to just take the opportunity to save some uh, time in the recording here and cut some footage out.